Welcome everybody. The Powerhouse Museum has been in existence with different names since 1880. It was formed after the success of the Sydney International Exhibition in 1879 to provide education, particularly in the application of new science and technology to industry, but also to promote an appreciation of applied arts. The things we make embody ideas, values and beliefs of the people who make and use them. Collections of related material track the development and acceptance or otherwise of those ideas in our society. Looking at those ideas, values and beliefs allows us to reflect upon our own circumstances and see, perhaps see familiar patterns emerging. Objects then are anchors for stories. They can be understood as elements of cultural memory. For the 2021 Sydney Science Festival, we have assembled a small collection to prompt conversation about digital technologies and their origins, the ethical quandaries surrounding automation arts and social media, and the cultural, culture and ideology of Silicon Valley, which still informs popular imaginings of a successful innovation economy. Today, we have a guest who has been involved in the development of those technologies for the last 40 years or so, and who has long, uh, thought long and hard about the culture that surrounds them. Jaron Lanier is a pioneering American technologist, best known as one of the founders of virtual reality. Uh, he coined the term. He is a computer scientist, musician, composer, an author who writes about the high-end technology business, the social impact of technology, and the future of humanism. In 2018, he was named by Wired magazine as one of the 25 most influential people in the last 25 years of technology history. His books include Who Owns the Future, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, and last year he appeared in the Netflix documentary The Social Dilemma. Jaron Lanier, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Um, thank you for joining us today for the two, uh, 2021 Sci Sydney Science Festival. Um, I have to say, from reading your work and looking at your room there, I can see <laughs> we get the feeling that you share our belief in the power of artefacts. Um, um, well, I, I, I have a particular um, mental illness that requires me to always be learning a new musical instrument from some part of the world or from some period in history. So I've ended up with uh, literally thousands. This is just a tiny portion. And I, I, I always think of musical instruments as being the most expressive machines and therefore, in a way, the most advanced machines. So they, they inspire me and, and remind me how far computers have to go. Yeah. Well, I'd like to start today's discussion, if I may, with an instrument that we don't have in our collection, something we might have to remedy soon, but uh, something I know uh, means a lot to you and that you have examples of in your collection. I understand this is called a can. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the can? Well, it's one example of a family of instruments that are usually called uh, free reed mouth organs. They're found all over Asia. Uh, this particular one is found in uh, Northeast Thailand and in Laos even more so. Uh, it's uh, a fascinating instrument. It, 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 well, I'll play it a little later. It sounds like a whole horn section or like a whole orchestra. It can be incredibly fun to play and impressive. Um, there are versions in China, Japan, Korea, uh, Vietnam, all over the place. Uh, I have many s stories about it. Uh, when I was a teenager, I took one apart with a great physicist, Richard Feynman, trying to figure out exactly how they work, because we know almost how they work, but there are a few subtleties that are actually a little hard to understand, and there have been a, there have been a few physics dissertations on the details. I'm not convinced anybody completely understands it yet, so it's a wonderful example of folk technology being a little ahead of our theory, even to this day. Um, it's... Uh, arguably the first digital number because these things are quite ancient and uh probably so this gets i'm not good, i'm not a scholar so this can be a debate but probably the ancestors of this predate the abacus and you have a bunch of tubes in fixed positions in parallel each tube being on or off combinatorially thus a binary number 
uh, millennia before Leibniz. So uh, I, I think we have here the origin of uh, digital numbers. Uh, binary uh, logic is part of our human makeup. Is that what you would be suggesting if it's that ancient? This is a, a binary number-like thing from a completely different part of the world, mm -hmm. from the artifact that you're zoomed in on now, uh, the, a card for a jacquard loom. Uh, and when you have something that universal, yeah, maybe that, that does indicate something common in the human condition. It is often said in my world that uh, just prior to Jacquard's invention of this programmable loom, there was a popularity, a sort of a craze for algorithmic music. And there, there are a few famous examples. Probably the most famous one is Mozart incorporating throws of dice into musical comp uh, com uh, composition. But there was another one, which was a non-deterministic player piano, which would play roles slightly differently each time. So it had an element of chance built into mm -hmm. the way it would play. And it is said that the that Jacquard was inspired by this player piano that included a tiny, tiny foretelling of algorithms. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm not making a truth claim. I'm making a effective mythology claim, but it might very well be true. <laughs> For mine, I can let you know that Jacquard built his loom having seen other people's attempts at automatic looming, including Vaucassin, who had produced the, the automata, the famous automata, the, the duck. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the automata were definitely another source, and yeah. everybody did really want an automata that wasn't strictly repetitive. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was the fraud, the, the, uh, the mechanical Turk that everyone knows about. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's definitely an origin point. I'd love to get more information on this early non-deterministic player piano. That would be a great thing to have, but I've never been able to find much about it. It did exist. The, the Jacquard loom, of course, <coughs> uh, was a, the earliest uh, examples of very successful automation uh, of, a, of a process which ultimately mm -hmm. created a huge industry and changes to the economy. Um, not all of those changes were um, felt by everybody. Can you tell us what you understand about some of the negative sides of that oh. invention? Hmm. Well, this is a huge topic, of course. Um, the notion of machines putting people out of work uh, was one of the main motivations for most of the political turmoil, actually, in recent centuries. It was one of the uh, it was one of the emotional underpinnings of the impulse to Marxism in the 19th century. Uh, it, uh, it fueled, uh, of course, directly the Luddite riots, mm. uh, which set the tone for, I would say, urban protest and resistance uh, that still holds sway today. Uh, mm. it's, so it's, it's, an, it's an enormous topic. Uh, I believe there is an interesting reconciliation possible. Part of it is uh, uh, Edward Deming, the, uh, the American scientist who came up with the notion of quality in business, that you gather statistics about what you do to improve your business, mm -hmm. which is now considered obvious, but at the time was not at all. It was an entirely new application of uh, statistics. Uh, and, and this is uh, early 20th century. But he had this other idea that the people who should receive these statistics were not just managers and engineers, but line workers, because they would have the wisdom for how to improve uh, even mostly automatic procedures. Mm. And the first companies to undertake uh, uh, the implementation of his ideas were the Japanese manufacturers, such as Toyota. And there, the concept is known as Kaizen. And the, it was enormously successful and created more reliable cars, and it's quite widely adopted, not universally, interestingly. Um, and so this notion that when you have a lot of machines, you actually have more distributed options and opportunities for people to express creativity and wisdom than before is correct. And if there's economic opportunity associated with that, you actually can have the tide ri the rising tide lift all boats. There is a way to do it. What I might do is show you an image now of uh, 
a, a portrait of Joseph Marie Jacquard, if he's there, as an introduction to another character. Are you familiar with this um, portrait? Um, it, I got it here, but once again, I'm not a scholar, so I'm not absolutely that's, certain. That's fine, I and I take great delight in, in asking you to look at it and imagine what it might be. Charles Babbage kept uh, a portrait like this on his wall in his um, uh, study, and, mm -hmm. and he would invite people when they came over to look at it and tell him how it had been formed. Uh, frequently people thought of it as a etching or maybe a drawing, a very fine drawing, um, but in fact it's a silk weaving done with 24,000 Jacquard cards and it was commissioned by the city of Lyon in the 19, 1830s and Babbage had a copy oh, of it. This is really marvellous. Yeah. No, I would not have put that together. I feel like maybe I vaguely heard this before, but uh, at this moment anyway, it's once again fresh to me, so this is truly marvellous. So, and it looks yeah. wonderful. I was going to say that uh, Babbage, of course, was very much inspired by what he saw when he travelled to Europe and looked at various forms of manufacture. And he, he ordered one of these and he was transfixed by the digital uh, cards, the cards that, uh, the Jacquard cards that controlled mm -hmm. those looms. And he brought that uh, back with him. Now, we have a machine in our collection that's here next to me. Uh, it's a fragment of just difference engine number one. It's made from original parts. It was assembled by Babbage's son to demonstrate the basic carry and a, uh, carry mechanism. Uh, it is, it's a difference engine, which have, uh, was Charles Babbage's first engines. Mm -hmm. Did you want to talk about what you understand Charles Babbage's contribution was to? Sure. Oh my. Well, okay. So this is, this is a whole fascinating story. Um, there's an element of tra tragedy in it because one wishes Charles Bab Babbage had finished more machine, had finished things, right? Mm. Had actually made a working animal after this, which would have been astonishing. But at any rate, the mere fact that he had the vision for it and started is absolutely incredible. Um, I, I want to say something a little geeky about it, if that's okay. This notion of this machine incrementally approaching a goal actually is a stronger precedent for the type of computation that's running our world today than even, even the abstraction of the Turing machine. And so I think uh, when you look back, if you look at it in that light, I think it's even more remarkably uh, prescient. So uh, it's a, it's, uh, these are just extraordinary devices. It's a, uh, a remarkable moment in history that, that produced them. I think um, Babbage produced this machine in order to uh, improve the, pr the problems that he saw with log tables, the generation of, uh, you know, generating tables, which was done by mm -hmm. hand. And so the express purpose of this machine was to eliminate human error from this process of generating uh, aids to calculation, which were the mathematical tables. Um, but he also saw it as a, um, an opportunity to free up people from the drudgery of boring calculations so that there would be right. more time spent philosophizing. The, the, the difference between a calculator and a computer is that a computer increases the opportunity, a calculator decreases them. <laughs> right. Just if you didn't know, that's a, no. that's the formal. That's where you draw the line. He one of the reasons he failed, I think, was because uh, his mind started to drift before he finished his calculator, mm -hmm. and uh, he was interested in this. The calculator worked with polynomial functions, and he started to think of other functions that he wanted to work with, and designed a much more versatile machine. And um, that machine was the analytical engine. <clears throat> he had a um, he had a, a companion work with him to a certain extent on that machine. In our collection, we have some letters. In, we have a lot of letters to Charles Babbage from various people, but these are some of our favorites. They're not about mathematics, they're not about computation, but they do represent Charles Babbage's, or they speak to Charles Babbage's relationship with Ada Augusta Lovelace, Countess Lovelace. Can you How speak about her she? contributions? 
Yeah, how old was she when these letters were written? Uh, that's a good question. These were 1840s. Were, that's when he was doing his... Um, mm -hmm. So I think she was in her early 30s at this time. Well, Ada Lovelace is celebrated as the first programmer, and I think that's a justified designation, even though everything was so tentative at that time that not, there wasn't really programming happening in practice, but it was almost, almost. And uh, she, she's remarkable on a couple of levels. One is she's the first person who seemed to have a feeling for what programming might be like. She's the first person to speculate with any connection to reality at all about what an artificial intelligent program might be like. Um, one person who did challenge Ada uh, and who also put a lot of time, well, he put a lot of time thinking about a mathematical problem <coughs> that ended up, through which he ended up producing a, a sort of fundamental foundation for computing machines. But I feel it's like I'm on the television quiz show. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do know what that is. You yes. know what it okay. is. So, <clears throat> the Enigma machine, Alan Turing. Can you tell us a bit about Alan Turing's original conception? Sure. So, um, one of the things about this, I, I, I have had the good fortune to meet a few people who uh, worked at Bletchley Park directly with Turing. In fact, once I was giving a lecture in uh, Victoria, Canada, in British Columbia, and a woman came up from the audience and said, oh, I, I worked with Turing, and she turned out to have been one of the Boffins, one of the unacknowledged female mathematicians working on the team. And so I was able to hear quite a few stories from her, and you're gonna ask, what was her name? And I don't remember, because I wasn't prepared for this, so I am so sorry, but um, it's something one can find online. I think even in my books, I have a, a, a chapter about her. Um, and so having, you know, having a direct participant to talk to is so different than book knowledge, you know, it's, so that was a particularly fortunate and wonderful thing. Um, I asked her many, many questions. I asked her some specific questions about how they cracked it, and she said, you know, some some of the details are still classified. She wasn't going to talk to me, because we know a lot about it. We can certainly infer it, but some of the little things are still kind of, they're not ready to kind of, so, you know, whatever. But uh, uh, the uh, I asked her if they knew uh, if they knew that Turing was gay, and she looked at me like, Oh, my darling, do you think that we were stupid? We were the best mathematicians from Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, and um, uh, of, of course we knew if we could crack the Nazi secret code, we understood Alan's private life. I mean, do you, do you really even have to ask? So I, I felt embarrassed, you know, because of course, like they do. She also was adamant. Now, I don't remember which way these went. I'm sort of embarrassed. But she was adamant, I think, that the Oxford girls were much, much more effective and smarter than the Cambridge ones. Uh, that was like a really, she repeated that over and over, like after all these decades. That was the important information, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and so anyway, uh, you know, the, the overall story is that um, World War II was an absolutely horrific, very high velocity, very high carnage, awful, awful, super high stakes battle to control the world. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't limited to some simple goal like controlling some little area somewhere, some oil field or something. The idea was just to, to control history in the world and it was um, therefore ter terrifying. And when I talk to people from the era, I find that it's almost impossible for me to internalize what they must have gone through. Uh, the Nazis believed that, so so um, encryption was absolutely vital because things were moving so quickly that being able to communicate about what was happening uh, was uh, central to any strategy because the whole point was that the technology was moving so fast that the other side really wouldn't know what to expect. So if you're, if you're uh, if your secrecy was compromised, you'd lose the benefits of these extraordinary uh, technologies going on. Now, as it happens to our knowledge, I believe most secrets that were of strategic significance actually were cracked. Uh, Turing and a few, but it wasn't really Turing alone, it was a whole interesting group of people, including the unacknowledged female boffins, uh, came up with a series of ideas and they had an uh, early computing machine 
uh, that definitely harked back to Babbage in a sense. It was a, um, uh, let's say it was a, it was a, like you selected from a large number of things it could do kind of explicitly and then it would do that. It had that character. I mean, I guess you could say that of any computer, but that's not really the effective way to think about larger computers. Um, and they cracked it. They did it. And then, of course, I created one of the famous moral dilemmas where uh, Britain and the Allies had to pretend it hadn't been cracked and allow a great deal of suffering and death to occur in order to maintain their advantage uh, from, from that knowledge. Uh, and then, of course, the other terrible, terrible, terrible thing is... Uh, Turing, who had, uh, and I think everybody knows this now because there was a movie about it. When, and when I was a young computer scientist, this was taboo and nobody knew about it. But uh, Turing um, was gay, and at the time, it was not a legal uh, way of life. And so in post-war Britain, on the one hand, he was celebrated as one of the great war heroes. On the other hand, he was forced to undergo, undergo a sort of bizarre quack uh hormone therapy that was supposed to reverse his his homosexuality and it was it was it's so weird and twisted I won't even go into it now but uh, in the course of that he did uh, so far as we as anyone can tell commit suicide by eat, eating a poisoned apple next to his uh, computer you know at Bletchley Park which is uh, something that is still um, a shame and an embarrassment on our field in a way uh, that you know nobody helped him really and uh, so I've always felt that that was sort of almost like an it's not the only one but it's one of the original sins of computer science that we've never we've never quite developed a culture or politics or courageousness of compassion that we need if we're going to have as much impact so it's, it's, it continues to bother me to this day if when I read Turing, what I think I am reading is someone absolutely tormented. Here, I came up with the idea to defeat the Nazis, and he arguably, I mean, Bletchley Park arguably did as much as Los Alamos. You know, I mean, it was a very central, it was a really, really big deal. And um, Turing is saying here, I'm defeating, I'm I'm struggling against these fascists who want to kill people for who they are, and yet my own society, my own government wants to kill me for who I am um, and this whole human world is so troubled maybe we do need to retreat into some sort of heaven of automata that would escape these human cruelties that that's what I think I'm, I'm reading I think I think the Turing test is a scream from somebody who's being tortured to death for who he is we might jump forward a few decades we have a um, machine here. There it is. Oh, right. yeah. yes. Um, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, one of, I think, two Apple Ones that we know came to Australia. And we're delighted to have this one in our collection. We're really thrilled that the owner uh, apparently decided not to take the um, case that was available from from Apple at the time from from the Steves uh, and mounted his uh, Apple One board there in a briefcase with mm -hmm. a keyboard and a and a cassette tape. Uh, let's see. What can I tell you? Um, I knew both of them, both the Steves. Uh, the 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 Steve Jobs of in our youth. Uh, I, I would have been in my late teens and early 20s, the first to go around, was a very difficult person to be around, kind of cruel, kind of a, a social genius who um, manipulated the people around him. I'm not saying something that he would disagree with. He's described himself as a, from that era as being an asshole. <coughs> um, I think he got better later, but, you know, he was really tough. I recognize some of these chips. I remember, oh, my God. Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, they, um, uh, Apple, it's a funny thing about Apple. It was the first, it was the first Silicon Valley company that had figured out this fusion. There were hippie techie companies and hippie, te hippie techie groups before, but to get to be totally maxed out capitalist and totally maxed out hippie at the same time, countercultural at the same time, was a new synthesis, and Apple was the first 
place that I think, you know, kind of got there. Uh, and so it, it had an amazing energy and attracted all sorts of interesting people from all over. Um, wow. I mean, um, what can I say? The other thing is the, um, this sort of device, the Apple One, really couldn't do anything. I mean, like, it, I, it would be, it, it's arguable that this, is not that more functional than one of Babbage's <laughs> partially built things because you couldn't really make it, you couldn't really attach it to anything reliably and you couldn't you know, the whole thing was built on the on people who could kind of see what it would turn into and the excitement of that so it's a it's a really interesting artifact of projection and hope and speculation rather than a purely functional artifact in its own right that also makes it quite fascinating so has Silicon Valley changed today? Is it the same? Does it believe it's oh, own? Yeah, I mean, uh, Silicon Valley, um, Silicon Valley has suffered a crisis of moral and spiritual integrity from um, excessive uh, success. Silicon Valley has become such a center of power and wealth that people have allowed their narcissism to cloud their thinking and uh, there's not everybody but you know it's 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 a uh, it's deeply troubling to me it's deeply troubling the effect it's had on the world it's deeply troubling the self-assuredness with which some of the people still think despite obvious apparent failures there's also a rise of a, a, a style of personality and cognition which some people think is similar to being on the spectrum i'm not sure if it's the same thing but this kind of nerdiness associated with power has become uh, the the norm and uh, it hasn't worked out well for a lot of people. It's worked out well for a few though, certainly. Um, and uh, it, it troubles me greatly. Uh, I, I believe it can be to the discussion about data dignity and so forth we were talking about before. Some sort of a more equitable and honest way of bringing co computation into the world is still possible. But right now, unfortunately, <clears throat> if you run the big computers on the network, you can gather data from people and then use it to run behaviorist algorithms to manipulate those people, uh, use it to concentrate wealth and power and make the whole world n nutso uh, as the price you pay until everything gets like just more and more weirdly paranoid and crazy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of a patheticness to what we're doing now uh, that... A kind of a pettiness that uh, I find embarrassing, but there we are. Now, can you tell us then, looking at the Apple One, you you must have used a few computers in your day. Do you remember your early machines? Can you tell us? What oh you yeah. Used? So I mean, um, when I was starting on machines, I was a a young teenager, and I I grew up in southern New Mexico, so I I happened to have access to. Uh, computers in the basement of uh, uh, the university near White Sands that had the earliest act. Really unbelievable good luck for me. So I tended to, I was using all kinds of early machines. There was a thing called the PDP-11, I remember uh, well. And, but these were the machines from this other universe. They weren't from the hippie computing, uh, put it in a suitcase world of Apple. These were sort of big computing like military uh, machines they were very expensive they were very elite they were considered um something you control with guards that you you know that it, they, they were it, it was it wasn't it wasn't like an the apple feeling it was completely different uh and so i was working with those i remember programming on punch cards like the jacquard loom and then the new mexico wins having like tornadoes of punch cards flying in the air and people desperately running after their programs. <laughs> the sort of randomization of programs. Um, I remember all of these things very, very early. I remember probably when I was 13 or 14, seeing a picture of somebody who had been able to make a picture of a cube in a computer, uh, that person being Ivan Sutherland, of course, and just being so excited, I could barely contain myself, just the very, very earliest things. And then it wasn't that many years later. Of course, for me at that age, it felt like an eternity later, but it wasn't uh, m that many years until things like the Apple One started to happen um, because of... Uh, of companies like Intel and others putting out little early chips that you could really combine into make, making little computers. Uh, 
There, but there were even earlier ones from Apple. I mean, there was a kit to make your own. I think it was called the Altair or something, and we were all making little little computers. And once again, couldn't do anything, but it still is remarkable that we could do it. We do have an Altair in the collection. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I have mine probably in some closet somewhere. God knows. We have a Lisa as well, which I understand you may have used a, an Apple Lisa. Yeah, I, I have um, I have all kinds of really Apple stuff somewhere. Now people are going to try to find my storage units and break into them. I have a wire wrap pre-release Macintosh, meaning before they had settled on the on the circuit board uh, somewhere. Um, uh, and I and I definitely have a Lisa somewhere. I think. Oh God, where is that thing? I don't know. Anyway, I have all this crazy early stuff. Um, there were a few other amazing things back then. There was um, Pixar, the company now known for um, animated movies, started off as a computer company, and there was actually a Pixar computer for a while, just as like an early computer that could process, could do photo editing and stuff. It's, it's, all, all these crazy things happened. So, um, so, yeah. Perhaps we'll move on to, can I, can I get you to show us the footage of... Um, the museum's first foray into virtual reality. So I don't know if you're familiar with this particular system. And as you can see from the footage, it's um, extremely uh, large polygons there. The, once you had your headset on, it was nowhere near as clear as it suggests on the screen here, the vision turning up to try um, to try to get one of the 150 places that were available each day and mm -hmm. we had to raffle opportunities to try the the VR game and no one said this is terrible everybody wanted to boast about the fact that they'd had a try at VR so mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it was a huge phenomenon when it when it hit the media um, and I was uh, interviewed uh, quite a few times, regardless of what I was interviewed about, I was, it always became a story about electronic LSD or teledildonics. Mm. Mm. Um, it got its own momentum. And mm. um, uh, you, more than anyone, has been credited with uh, creating virtual reality, even though you acknowledge your um, the other pioneers who influenced you. Can you tell us about your first conceptions? of the idea of VR. There's been a kind of a craze for VR at different periods of time. There was one, I don't know, sometime between five and ten years ago, perhaps, um, or maybe even a bit earlier. And a lot of young people think that that's when VR first appeared, which is kind of funny. Um, and now I feel like it almost has a bit of an older feeling, because I, I don't think it was, honestly, I just don't think it was done well in the last iteration. but. Um, but you know that's just me it, it's true that the so this was 90s vr there there had been vr that if i may say so probably looked a little better than this earlier but it was much more expensive uh th this was one of the next wave of companies that was trying to kind of a little lower the cost a little bit although it's still crazy expensive by today's standards i mean create you probably spent tens of thousands of dollars on whatever it was i would imagine but not hundreds so it was a little better uh, the early ones were like a million dollars a person. Um, anyway, so what was the early conception like? This goes back uh, for me to the late 70s. Means that people had for connecting with one another were somewhat limited. I thought part of the problem was that this method of language of using words was just inadequate. And I imagine that being able to create shared, I, I used to call them shared waking state, intentional dreams, that this kind of using a shared virtual world to create and would lead to something more than words that people could use to connect. That's what it meant to me early on. And I was, I was um, very taken by the surrealist art traditions from different periods. And uh, uh, so, that, you know, so for me, it started off as that kind of idea, not really a techie one. And of course, what happened rapidly is it became a very techie one. And I spent the 80s on the early systems trying to prototype uh, practical applications rather than anything about uh, communications or entertainment. So for instance, uh, a really big one in the late 80s was the first surgical simulators. That was huge. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 
uh, vehicle prototyping, particularly for aviation and then for cars. And then, uh, so anyway, for all these things, uh, that, that's really what I was, I was, I was uh, working on at that time. Um, you mentioned electronic LSD and teledildonics. I hadn't, I hadn't heard teledildonics in many years. It's a funny one. It's kind of, uh, Tim, Tim had contracted to do a workshop on expanded consciousness and LSD or some, some such, and this would have been in the eighties. And we were going to try to meet because he wanted to learn about virtual reality. And he said, I'm stuck under contract to do this horrible thing. And I just, I hate this whole thing. So there's this guy who makes a living and who impersonates me in LA. Um, I've hired him to come and replace me to finish my class. And I said, how's that going to work? He said, well, all these people are high. They're not going to know. And so I said, well, okay. He said, so what I want you to do is I want you to sneak into Esalen and sneak me out in the back of your car. And so I had, you know, we were talking about all these early, like the wire wrap Macintosh and early, all these early computers. They were just permanently in the back of my car, which was this crazy, uh, I, I paid for college with a goat herd. I used to make my own goat cheese and milk. And I had this car that I swapped with somebody for and it. It was like a very beat up car that had bullet holes and had no floor and it started with a screwdriver it was just this completely horrible car but the trunk was completely filled with historic um, computers that you would freak over as a curator now and so i had to make a timothy leary sized hole in it to put him in so i went with a friend to a dumpster on the stanford campus and we threw away all these priceless computers to make room for tim and then sure enough i snuck him out uh so that's how i met tim actually the first time he was he was snuck out in the back of a jala a goat. It had no back seats. There was like hay, and I'd move goats in it. Anyway, he was snuck out in the back of this crazy car in a, in an airspace that had once had computers that would now be priceless. But so I, I liked him. Tim was a, became kind of a close friend. I wouldn't say a deeply close friend, but somebody I knew pretty well for many years. And he, uh, what do I guess? What do I say about Tim? Um, uh, I did not like his approach to things. He was somebody who was yet another social genius like Steve Jobs or many others where he just had this compulsion to come up with things that would get attention and get people to be thinking about him no matter what. And so um, he'd, uh, he'd made LSD into this notorious thing that was banned and he was thrown in jail over it and all this stuff. He'd like created a lot of trouble that maybe didn't need to happen. Maybe that whole thing was a mistake, a sort of an attention getting thing. And then he wanted to do the same thing with with uh, virtual reality. And I was like, no, don't do it to us. Don't, stop. Yeah. You're familiar with this. This is one that you uh, have some involvement with. Yeah. So what happened was um, the early virtual reality systems um, had gloves. So you put on gloves to manipulate virtual objects. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely inconceivable to track a hand with a camera in those days. Computers just weren't fast enough, so that was the only way to do it. So we had computer gloves for virtual data gloves. Oh, by the way, the, all right, so this is something you probably wish you had. This is the very first, uh, this is the very first uh, virtual reality headset that was sold commercially. And the way I came by, and the little company I have is called VPL. So this was uh, 80, so 86, I don't know, something. This is an early one. And um, the company was founded in 84, so maybe it's 85, something like that. This one went to Stanford University initially and was used for prototyping surgical simulators, mm -hmm. um, which was a big project. And then when they upgraded to newer ones, it was donated to an arts collective called Survival Research Lab that was a super notorious punk radical art collective that used it to make tele-robotic, like, automated monsters that would attack the audience with with and it was just crazy stuff and uh, and then when they finally went out of business somebody said oh hey do you want this back and i said um yes i do <laughs> so that's have um anyway um the um i met um the mattel toy company one of the big toy companies uh had a very wonderful um, designer engineer named Rich Gold and I'm mentioning him now because I, I had fallen out of touch and I only recently learned that he passed away a decade ago which I had not been aware of. Uh, Rich was a musician first as are so many and uh, uh, he'd been part of something called the Automated Aut Automatic Musicians Society or something or collective or something and he uh, he and a bunch of other people uh, 
worked on making our VR gloves into sort of a toy, you couldn't do a lot, but you could do a little with them, and they're actually not too bad. Uh, they, uh, they have a few problems, but they actually sort of work, which is kind of amazing. And uh, it became a hit. I remember the day it came out, Mattel's stock went up many percentage points. I realized they created all these millionaires from people who own Mattel stock. It was, uh, but it was a big deal. It became like a media sensation for a while. I forget when this was exactly. Was this like 89-ish? Is that about right? 90-ish? I think so, like yes. Uh, for about one year they produced them. Yeah. yeah, something like that. It might have been a year earlier than that. I'm not sure, but so, something like that. So it was kind of um, the one of the, it's probably the first mass market manufactured virtual reality thing, depending on how you define it. Uh, there's some others that weren't too far after, but I think this was the first one. You didn't um, um, uh, you didn't nominate yourself to be part of the ad that they. Well, you have to understand in those days. Uh, I was working like 18 hours a day on surgical simulation. To me, this kind of stuff was kind of not what, where the action was from my perspective. But it's it's nice it's nice that it happened. Uh, but I wasn't really no, I wasn't really that that uh, in, involved in the power gloves life out in the world. A little bit once in a while, something would happen, but not too much. Um, we might move on to. The next topic, if we can bring up now, this is a machine <coughs> uh, that was produced in 1912 here in Australia, <coughs> and I have to say that the shooting in Australia owes as much to gambling as it does to anything else, any scientific or military, uh, the usual mm -hmm. drivers of this stuff. Um, this is a, the tote machine, a totalizer machine, is a machine that was produced to help. Um, it was an alternative form of betting to using a bookmaker and it was extremely popular here in Australia and in fact a, a very big industry was built on the back of the development of this tote machine which while it was simple computationally it was actually a multi-user real-time a real-time multi-user network system that allowed lots of uh, lots of simultaneous bets being put on the same horse at the same time Oh, that's and, fascinating. Yeah. Huh. And it, it has a sort of Babbage-esque um, quality to it. But I'll go to the, uh, I'll just mention that, you know, gambling's been involved with our computing industry for some time. Can we go to the next picture? I asked the company um, who produced it uh, whether they had any others that were in the same league and why didn't they, you know, what was the formula to this and couldn't they reproduce it? And they said they... They, they were trying and couldn't, that it just had its own feel. That, um, oh, isn't that interesting? Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, nevertheless, it did involve using interact, more, putting more interactivity into simple poker machines and uh, can conceivably be seen as being part of the problem rather than part of the solution in, in relation to gambling. Um, mm. Can you tell us about the relationship between gambling and social media that you've been discussing recently? Oh, God. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just have to mention in passing that I don't want to in any way deny Australia's unique and cherished relationship to criminality. However, in America as well, uh, the video game industry has an origin that's in part from the organized crime world. The, uh, our early video game machines, not the very earliest one, uh, like Pong, but just right after that, the ones that had a general look like this where there'd be a screen and uh, some graphics, uh, largely came from a company called Bali based in Chicago that was kind of a legacy company for money laundering. I, you know, like, I, I don't want to accuse anybody of anything, but you know, they, they did generate a lot of slots and it did create a certain opportunity for statements of dubious historical value, uh, of which I'm also making, but with a different intent and quality. All right, so uh, gambling, um, gambling's an ancient human addiction and a universal one. It's, it's something that's part of who we are. Uh, it's part of who we are because we evolved to be able to make very quick and committed cognitive uh, 
summaries, assessments of what's going on. Should I be scared? This is the fight or flight, the lizard brain, it's sometimes called. What should I, you know, because we don't have time to sit around analyzing data in, 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 uh, in our evolutionary context. You know, we're just like, got to figure it out. And so gambling takes advantage, it activates those circuits where you're sort of trying to discern a pattern, but where there isn't one. The behaviorists, uh, particularly B.F. Skidder, but starting with Pavlov, realized that adding a bit of random feedback in a behaviorist uh, beha modification program where you're training a pigeon or a rat or a person, particularly like a Facebook user, to do something, the randomness intrigues them because the, the, the drive for our brains to try to pick out what's going on, even if there's no real information there, is just so deep and so profound that we cannot resist it. So that is the, and, and so um, Facebook algorithms work that way to drive engagement and as well as all the other social media, YouTube and so forth. Um, same with gambling. Uh, social media is worse than gambling because gambling is redundant. Like you just keep on doing the same thing. It's like the same, it's the basic same game all over again. But the um, Algorithms and social media use the same underlying uh, cognitive quirks uh, to customize uh, content that people are getting that optimizes that kind of, you know, addictive degradation. And then that makes people crazy. They start believing weird things. They start getting weirdly nervous and uh, scared or aggressive gradually, but it just kind of raises the temperature all over the world of, of, mm -hmm. of craziness. And so it's, it's worse than gambling, but fundamentally the relationship between gambling algorithms and, uh, and human cognition and social media algorithms and human cognition are quite similar. And gambling, uh, gambling addiction is an excellent uh, model t to understand uh, social media addiction. Right. And you advocate to um, turn off our social media disconnect. Well, I mean, I don't advocate that people do anything because I don't, I don't know people's individual cases. I'm always adamant about that. I'm not telling people to... I did write a book called, with arguments to delete your accounts. I'm not, that doesn't mean I think anyone should. I think they should know the arguments for doing so and they should be more conscious. Um, ultimately, people are powerless to resist on some levels, not just because of the addiction algorithm, but just because of the centrality that these services have taken on in the world. Um, but I think th the solution is obviously to change the business model so that it's based on providing a service people are willing to pay for rather than manipulating the people. And I believe that that's a transition that we actually will make. I'm, I'm optimistic. I just don't think it'll happen fast. Good. I might ask you one more question, if I may, before mm -hmm. I believe you're going to uh, perform for us. But this can, can I mention an artifact? May I interrupt you and destroy please, your camera? Please. Yeah. Um, this is an iPhone, and uh, first. Uh, oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, do you know what the Pocket Big Brain was? The Pocket Big Brain? No, I don't know. I'm... Okay, it was the prototype for the iPhone uh, many years earlier. The, mm. the, when was the first iPhone exactly? Was that two thousand and seven? I think it came. Seven, yeah. Mm. So there was something that looked very much like an iPhone mm. in about eighty seven, and it was called the Pocket Big Brain. It was kept quite secret, although Jobs was sure obsessed about it. Uh, I remember playing with one of them, and it was a French design. It was a French startup in great stealth. It was um, only black and white, kind of big pixels, but it was a little thing about that form factor with little apps and the whole thing. And they were foreseeing this thing called 3G that would happen someday when they'd be connected. And the whole thing was there. It was actually started as a French company for those who are curious about the history. And somewhere, somewhere, there are prototype bit pocket big brains. You should try to get one of those. They're amazing. They really are the iPhone. I mean, that was not Apple's design. That, that far predated, I mean, decades. Oh, thanks for that tip. I mean, like about that. Two, two decades, two decades earlier. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, pl please go ahead and ask the question that I prevented you from asking. So, um, the museum has one of its you know, mandates, we sort of document innovations through our collecting. <clears throat> um, 
a lot of technological innovation, but not exclusively along those stories, in the view that we will tell those stories, stories of successful innovation will beget other innovations. Um, uh, it's not unlike the one that we had when we started in the 1880s. Um, if we imagine the, the world, uh, if the word innovation hadn't been stripped of most of its meaning by you know, inauthentic overuse, um, we tell stories of innovation, um, we promote the value of science, the importance of creativity, education, learning, and the engagement with, um, with the everyday, stuff of everyday life, you know, with a, an attempt to try and re-enchant the stuff of everyday life. In doing so, we're attempting to um, encourage a culture of, of innovation, right? That would be what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. How do you think as a society, or as several connected societies, engender a culture of sustained and sustainable innovation where mm. we appropriately solve our own problems? Right. Um, is there, all, you know, do you think it's already there, but less utopian than we think? Is it too complex to influence? Mm. Is it the wrong question? Yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, and I also, um, I appreciate your acknowledgement of how fraught the word has become mm -hmm. as you ask the question. Um, I'm asked this question a great deal. I have been many, many times. And the undertone is often, we would like our own Silicon Valley, where, wherever it is. Like, why can't we have all these super rich companies here? wherever it might be. Um, and I, I'm going to say something really weird. I, um, I don't think we should have Silicon Valleys for innovation in the future. I, I mean, I, in, in one particular sense, which is that at the time that Apple started, or my, my, my old company, VPL, it's, that started virtual reality, um, I think our idea was that you you make something that people need, they buy it, and then you have a great business. It's kind of very straightforward. I feel that the new idea is that you get some kind of very special network effect where you go viral, and then you have your your super viral cryptocurrency or your super viral stock or something, something, uh, your, even your super viral TikTok video or whatever. And if you just get that thing, just because of the inherent ways that only a few things can go viral, that'll get, and everybody will know about them, and they intrinsically get more and more viral once it happens, because that's how networks are. This, this drive for virality is the, is the culprit that has made us less, less creative and less, uh, innovative, um, in the term of the, the sort of attractive use of the term. And so I think what we need to do is have some way of identifying and discouraging or banning or punishing virality as a thing in the future. Uh, it's funny because I remember when the term virality first came about, it was intended as a warning because viruses are bad. Mm. You know, like a virus is a thing that leeches off of these elaborately adapted species that have spent billions of years getting to where they are, and then the virus comes in and, and destructively catches a free ride just because it can. And there's, they're, once in a while they're good, but you know, um, not too much. And mostly they're destructive. And uh, I, I once was part of a little uh, thought experiment, like what if we could just destroy large classes of viruses would there be anything wrong with that? Would it do any damage to ecosystems or anything? And some of the, the ones that attack bacteria, phages might keep bacteria populations healthy. There are like a few things here and there where they might do something, but actually a lot of them we could really do without. They're kind of like mosquitoes. Like, you know, truth is we could get rid of them and we'd be better off. And, and the, the, that, that thing became this metaphor that every, everybody imagines that if you have a world driven by virality, they'll get to be the virus. But of course, very few will. That's how the statistics work out. So it becomes a world based on false hope and much more failure than success. Uh, virality is just a terrible thing, yet everybody wants it. 
And I think that that is probably our core problem in technical culture now. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our conversation. I understand ah. you might be ready to play some music for us. Yeah, well, I'm surrounded by instruments, so I could play many. Um, since you brought up the can and the idea that it might be the first digital instrument, I'll play one for a little bit. And if there's time, maybe I'll play something else that comes from Australia. loud and didn't distort for you. It's quite a sound, I must say. It's a wonderful sound. It's really a great instrument to play. Mm. This is not a traditional style. I, um, when I go to Laos and I play this, they really think I'm nuts. And, and uh, But more recently, I've noticed some of the kids copying the style, so it's starting to, to, to catch be a on. thing a little bit. Yeah, so. And thank you, everybody who's watching online. Um, stay safe and stay interested. Mm-hmm. <laughs>